all of the names put forward to be the bride of King Aegon III would take much more time than allows, but a few are worthy of mention. At Castle Rock, Lady Joanna Lannister set aside her war with the Iron Men long enough to right the hand and point out that her daughters, Sorel and Tyshara, were maidens of noble birth and marriageable age. The twice widowed Lady of Storm's End, Alenda Baratheon, put forward her own daughters, Cassandra and Ellen. Cassandra had once been betrothed to Aegon II and was well prepared to serve as queen, she wrote. From White Harbour came a raven from Lord Torrin, speaking of past marriage pacts between the dragon and the merman, broken by cruel chance, and suggesting that King Aegon might put all of this aright by taking a Mandalay for his queen. Sharis Footley, the widow of Tumbleton, made so bold of a move to nominate herself. Perhaps the boldest letter came from the irreprehensible Lady Samantha of Old Town, who declared that her sister, Sansara of House Tarly, is spirited and strong, and has read more books than half the maesters in the Citadel, whilst her good sister, Bethany of House Hightower, was very beautiful, with smooth skin and luscious hair, and the sweetest of manner, but also lazy and somewhat stupid if truth be told, though some men seem to like that in a wife. She concluded by suggesting that perhaps the king should marry both of them, one to rule beside him as Queen Alessand did, King Jaehaerys, and one to bed and breed, and in the event that both of them were found wanting, for whatever obscure reason, Lady Sam helpfully attached the names of 31 other noble maidens from House Hightower, Redwine, Tarly, Ambrose, Florence, Cobb, Costain, Breesby, and Vina who might be suitable queens. Mushroom adds that her ladyship ended with a cheeky postscript that said, I know some pretty boys as well, should his grace be so inclined, but I fear they could not give him airs, but none of the other chronicles mention this affront, and her ladyship's letters have been lost. In the face of so much focus on the matter, Lord Arwen was forced to think again, though he remained determined to wed his own daughter to Marielle to the king. He had to do so in a way that would not provoke the lords whose support he needed. Bowing to the inevitable, he mounted the Iron Throne and said, For the good of his people, his grace must take another wife. Though no woman will ever place our beloved Jehera in his heart, many have been put forward for this honour, the fairest flowers in the realm. Whichever girl King Aegon weds shall be the Alassane to his Jaehaerys, the Jonquil to his Florian. She will sleep by his side, birth his children, share his labours, soothe his brow when he is sick, grow old with him. It is only fitting, therefore, that we allow the king himself to make this choice. On Maiden's Day we shall have a ball the like of which King's Landing has not seen since the days of King Viserys. Let the maidens come from every corner of the Seven Kingdoms, and present themselves before the king, that his grace might choose the one best suited to share his life and love. And so the word went out, and a great excitement took hold from court and the city, and spread about across the realm. From the dawnless marches to the wall, doting fathers and proud mothers looked at their daughters, and wondered if she might be the one, and every highborn maid in Westeros began to primp, and sew and curl her hair, thinking, why not me? I might be the queen. Yet even before Lord Unwin had ascended the Iron Throne, he had sent a raven to Starpike, summoning his daughter to the city. Though Maiden's Day was yet three moons away, his lordship wanted Mariella at court, in hopes that she might befriend and beguile the king, and thus be chosen on the night of the ball. That much is known. What follows now is mere rumour, for it was said that even as he awaited the arrival of his own daughter, Unwin Peak also set in motion many secret plots and plans, designed to undermine, defame, distract and besmirch those damsels he deemed his daughter's most likely rivals. The suggestion that Cassandra Baratheon had pushed the little queen to her death was heard again and again, and the misdeeds of certain other young maidens, real or imagined, became common gossip about court. Jezebel Stoughton's fondness for wine was bruited about. The tale of Eleanor Massey's deflowering was told and retold. Rosamund Darry was said to be concealing six nipples under her bodice, supposedly because her mother had lain with a dog. Lyra Hayford was accused of having smothered an infant brother in a fit of jealousy, and it was put about that the three Janes, Jane Smallwood, Mooton, and Merriweather liked to dress in squires' garbs and visit brothels to kiss and fondle the women there, as if the three of them were boys. All this reached the king's ears, some from Mushroom's own lips, for the fool confessed to having been paid handsomely to poison egg on the third against these maids and others. The dwarf was much in his grace's company, following the death of Queen Jehera, though his japes could not dispel the king's gloom. They delighted gave him pale hair. Aegon often summoned him for the boy's sake. In his testimony, Mushroom says to Sario the Thumb gave him a choice of silver or steel, and to my shame, I bade him sheath the dagger and seize that sweet fat purse. Nor were the words the only means by which Lord Unwin sought to win his secret war for the king's heart, if the whispers can be believed. 
A groom was found abed with Tashara Lannister not long after the ball had been announced. The Lady Tashara claimed the lad climbed in through her window uninvited. Grand Mason Munkin's examination revealed her maiden head was broken. Lucinda Penrose was set upon by outlaws whilst hawking along Blackwater Bay, not half a day's ride from the castle. A hawk was killed, her horse stolen, and when one of the men held her down, another slit her nose open. Pretty Felena Stokeworth, a vivacious girl of eight, who sometimes played dolls the little queen, took a tumble down the serpentine steps and broke her leg, was Lady Buckler, and both her daughters drowned when the boat carrying them across Blackwater Bay foundered and sank. Some men began to talk with the Maiden Day's curse, while others were wiser in ways of power, saw unseen hands at work, held their tongues. Thank you.